All right. Here we are. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Lawyers on the Rocks. The Lawyers on the Rocks are me, Jeremy Eldridge, and Adam Crandall. We are produced by Gideon at Up Next Creative. Jeremy Eldridge practices criminal defense. I'm Kurt Nachman. I handle civil litigation and personal injury matters. And Adam Crandall does whatever it is that immigration lawyers do. We are Maryland-based lawyers. This is our show. On this week's episode, we are sampling Uncle Nearest Whiskey. Um, we have a special guest, Matthew Aubrey, also known as OBS, who's hanging out with us. We have a number of great topics, including uh, Balloon Boy, which Jeremy is going to be ready to chit-chat about. Yeah, I finally got pardoned. <laughs> And um, and if, if you get a chance, check us out online, lawyersontherocks.com, Facebook, Instagram. Email us, lawyersontherocks at gmail.com. Please share our posts, like our posts, and uh, give us a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere you get your if podcasts. If you do, you may end up with one of these cool Lawyers on the Rocks glasses right here. It's so big. It makes my hand look giant, doesn't it? Yeah, that's how small it is. I had, to, I had to like so many Instagram posts to get one of these glasses, and I'm on the fucking show. That's not all you had to do. No. True. We'll talk about that on the next episode, right. Balloon Boy. Wow. So to we're, trying, uh, we're trying Uncle Nearest. Yes, we are. Look, this one is near and dear to my heart. It's something that I've been drinking for a while. We all like to bring in some of our favorite spirits. And luckily, I mean, and what I love about your company already, I wrote on Instagram to Uncle Nearest. You guys got back to me lightning fast and said you were excited to do it. I got in touch with with OBS over there pretty quickly. And first of all, thank you for coming on. Uh, now, because of my conversation with you, and I, I said, all right, we're going to try. We had the 1856. And you said, you, so you've had the other one. And I didn't remember the name of the other one and then went out and bought the second bottle because I said, you know what? We're just going to drink both of these. We got a real professional on the show today. So, you know, I've read about the history, you know, every distillery has a history and, and most of them have really cool histories, but I think this one is a little different because it's got so many different parts of its cool history, not only dating back to two uncle nearest, but also the, the owner and proprietor of the company and her story. So can you tell us a little bit about the company? And the yes. History? So the company was founded in 2017. Um, kind of the short story is Fawn Weaver, who's our owner. She was a best-selling author, and she was on vacation in Thailand. And the New York Times released an article about the best whiskey maker you have not heard of. Um, the short, the short story kind of is um, on that bottle there. There's a, a farmhouse. That farmhouse is the Dan Call Farm. Dan Call owned a farm in Lynchburg, Tennessee. Uh, and on this farm, uh, he had a distillery. Uh, through Fawn's research, she found out that. That distillery is the Tennessee number seven distillery. So Nearest Green was a uh, slave at the time and Dan had him distilling his whiskey. Um, before that, he took in a little farmhand by the name of Jasper and Jasper was working on the farm and he kept wanting to see what was going down, down at the distillery. He's like, I wanna learn how to make whiskey. So Dan asked Nath uh, Nathan if uh, he could teach Jasper how to make whiskey. So he goes down there, they become close, they become friends. Jasper's learning how to make whiskey. Civil War happens, 13th Amendment, and Jack buys, Jasper buys the distillery. Uh, now, his nickname was Jack. So therefore, Jack Daniels hired Nearest Green to be his first ever master distiller for Jack Daniels whiskey. Um, Jack did the marketing, Nearest handled the whiskey making. Um, then at, back to Fawn finding the article. She flies from Thailand on vacation, tells her husband, I want to go to Lynchburg and learn more. It called to her. Um, and so she flew to Lynchburg, started researching. Um, she meets a woman by the name of Sherry Moore. Sherry's one of Jack's descendants, and she was the retired director of whiskey ops at Jack Daniels Distillery for 30 years. She had just retired and was getting into real estate. And just so happened that that, ha that house on the bottle was on the market. So within the span of about one week of leaving Thailand, Fawn not only went to Lynchburg to research everything, she bought that farm. That's awesome. Yeah, just bought the farm right there. So she's been doing some uh, you know, restoration on that. Uh, she's had some archeologists dig up to where the distillery used to sit. Um, 
So then she started more researching, talking to literally everybody in Lynchburg, Tennessee is either related to Nara Screen or Jack Daniels for the most part. So talking to all the family members. Um, and then finally she was like, do you guys want a book? She's a best-selling author. Do you guys want a movie? Her husband works at Sony Pictures. And they said, we think his name dessert should be on a bottle. So yeah. Sherry, Sherry, who just retired, was like, you want to make a whiskey? I'll come out of retirement. So 2017, the 1856, the 100 proof right there was the first one launched. Um, that is a blend of nine to 14 year old whiskeys. We do source right now. Our distillery is, should be finished early summer um, of, nine, of nine to 14 year old whiskeys and 100 proof. Um, then that next bottle came out in August of 19, which cool about 1884 is that is blended by nearest great great granddaughter, a woman by the name of Victoria Edie Butler. She had uh, retired from her job and kind of had this whiskey gene she didn't know about. So she started tasting whiskey and ended up blending what you're drinking, uh, as you called the other one when we talked about it, uh, the 1884. Um, and they've both just taken off, skyrocketed. Um, as you can hear from my voice, I'm originally from Kentucky. So I'm a Kentucky boy selling Tennessee whiskey, which in some circles is sacrilegious. I really, uh, it sounded like a Baltimore accent at first. I was trying to place, was, it, was it north or south? Was it like Hamden and Southern Baltimore? Yeah, you hide it really well. My, my other Southerner here, I think you're a real Southerner as compared to, to you know, my Tar Heel to my left over here. Well, I got, <laughs> I got, I got cowboy boots. I am from Louisville and I, I say Louisville is probably the northernmost Southern city and then southernmost Midwestern city. So it's a nice blend of, you know, those two regions. I've, I've driven that line. I can't remember the highway. It's been a while, but there's a highway that cuts through Kentucky where one exit, you can still get sweet tea and the next exit up. You can't. <laughs> yeah, nobody, I feel nobody, like that's, that, that's the real line between the North and the South. Nobody takes that exit where you can't get sweet tea. So. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I got a question for you that you've got some, some years on the bottles. Do, yep. the, do the years listed on the bottle signify anything? Yes, so the 1856, uh, during Fawn's research, that's the year she believed that he started distilling. Awesome. Um, so we believe that would be what he would make similar to today. Um, that is also translated into um, other things she found nearest like to do. Like as we're building our distillery, you know, when you go to most distilleries, they have huge three, four story tall rick houses. She had learned that he likes a one story rick house. So all our rick houses are going to be one story fits about three barrels high throughout. Um, the 1884, we believe, is the year he stopped distilling. So obviously we believe that, you know, this is this is what Victoria likes. This is to her palate. This is what she thinks will sell, which as you can tell, it's worked out pretty well. It works. Yeah. Uh, and then we also have our 1820, which is our top 1% of the 1856. That's our single barrel selection. It's very rare. Due to demand, we don't even have any right now because we're having to keep up with demand on 1856. I thought you said that if we put you on the podcast, we were getting the bottle. <laughs> I, I don't have a bottle. So if we get you back on, we can work that out. I'll just complain <laughs> enough on Instagram. I'll, I'll try. I'll, I'll just try. say you sexually harassed me and then magically a bottle will show up. That, <laughs> I think that's the way the Me Too stuff works on podcasts about liquor. Yeah. You know, I think my, my favorite thing, just to throw out a couple of things, because, you know, with having you on and... and reading so much and there's there's so much history there one of the coolest things and i i really encourage people when i've posted this stuff on our page already to go to your website and just look at some of the photographs and yeah. it looks like your company's been able to honor some really cool photographs and that the relationship between the green family and the jack daniels family doesn't appear to ever have been bitter yeah. and that and for instance there's a picture of and i think it's i guess it's his great granddaughter and another one they call them bonnie and clyde around town but these families really maintain this sort of wonderful relationship and then here we are paying homage to them you know right now and the fact that it's, it's black owned and it's, it's very well celebrated mm -hmm. it's just it's such such a good story yeah you know? and starting with a new york times article it's like yeah. it's it's a little ridiculous and funny at the same time so it called defawn because she believed it was a story of love when it first came out you know a lot of people are like jack daniels owned slaves and he stole the recipe and it's not his but she was like it, it's not like that they were friends you know, they came up with everything together. You know, nearest perfected the Lincoln County process, which um, is the process that makes a Tennessee whiskey a Tennessee whiskey. 
Right. Um, that's the large fats of maple sugar charcoal that filters the whiskey through drop by drop. To be a Tennessee whiskey, you have to go through that process. Um, we believe that is something um, that came from West Africa, because obviously during that time, probably a majority of slaves were distilling around the country. So in West Africa, to filter their water, they used charcoal. So they probably got over here drinking the stuff we were making, like, this is awful. So then they came up, <laughs> they came up with this charcoal. I mean, you've all had, I'm sure you've had moonshine, so you're probably, you know, straight mm -hmm. gasoline. Um, so he perfected that Lincoln County process. And, you know, to this day, like you said, Bonnie and Clyde, they, there's everyone's still friends. Um, and, you know, we have members of both families um, and even Brown Foreman to this day, there's still, there's never not been a member of the nearest family not working at Jack Daniels distillery. Well, I think the sign behind you sort of speaks yeah. to that. Welcome to the family yeah. Yeah. is, and, and you can tell that from all of the advertising, you can tell it from the website that there's a, a pretty good dedication. So let's get yeah. to the good stuff. We got 1856 in the glass. I'm going to beat you to the punch and say that before I could ask him whether I should have ice cubes here, he told me, you drink it neat or you don't drink it at all. And so because I can follow directions, I'm a good little Jewish boy. We follow directions and we got it poured. So talk to us a little about, about what we're drinking, what we should be tasting. Um, so with me, when it comes to tasting notes, with when you have wine, they're supposed to have certain notes. With whiskey... It is literally like almost a familiar feeling to you because if I get something and I tell you I taste it, then you're going to taste it. Oh, I'm if full you... familiar feeling. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, so with me, <laughs> with me, I get cinnamon, I get some nutmeg, I get vanilla, um, I get a lot of your classic bourbon notes. Um, now the reason that we have or at 100 proof is so smooth is because after the Lincoln County process we filtration through coconut shells. Okay. That carbon takes out some of the conditors that A, give you a hangover and make whiskey taste a little bit, you know, that little, oh, uh, when you take it down. See, this so is why, why like I'm said, not hungover today look. and you're hungover today. Yeah. yeah. It was the fucking drink, coconut shells. You coconut need to drink, drink more if whiskey. If somebody would have told me that before, I, I would have could have spent a lot of days not hungover. Yeah. This is like the number one reason so, to buy your beverage outside of the fact that it tastes really good. So, Obs, uh, yep. uh, Kurt was too cheap to give me the 1856, so I only have the 1884, and I'm wondering, is it also filtered through coconut shells? Both of them go through coconut shells. All right. Um, is that a yeah. normal thing? Is that yeah. a, I'm, I've just never, I've drank enough to, I should know that, but I never even heard that. I have not heard of any major brand else doing it. Uh, the reason for it is Sherry, who's our director of Whiskey Ops, is uh, one of the biggest whiskey nerd you will ever meet in your life to the point that she was the treasurer of the American Filtration Society. Oh, yeah. which they just talk about filtering water and whiskey. Um, and, you know, I've done events with her and, she, you know, she'll show you how you put, if you add iron to this, it makes the whiskey black and all types of deep, deep stuff, the yeast and all that stuff. Um, so, but yeah, they both go through the carbon. She found it out. She did it. As far as I know, nobody else does it. Not saying they don't. I just don't know. They do. Are you able to tell us about any other um, sort of yeah, future projects that you're working on? Um, we uh, there's there's something coming uh -oh. out soon. Another limited um, a limited edition um, that there'll be more news out for that. And then as our distillery gets up and running, obviously we'll be able to do some other stuff. Um, you know, different barrel finishes, you know, different, you know, maybe a rye one day, stuff like that. But it's all, you know, it's all R&D stuff once you have your own distillery. Um, so we're excited because demand is shot through the roof and we can't keep up with it. But when it's our distillery, we'll finally be able to keep up with the demand, which is a good thing. I mean, Maryland is killing it for us. They're one of our top five markets. Um, they've just taken to it. They love it. Uh, so it's it's been a great ride. I'm, I'm glad I came over in January of last year. So, I'm glad I'm contributing to Maryland being one of your top sellers. Yeah. <laughs> so just to, just well, to, right. a, a little secret. Maryland in 1820. We that's the year we think he was born. Uh, through Fawn's research, she found out he was born in Maryland. Nice. Uh, I knew so, there was uh, a connection to me. So uh, 
we haven't zeroed in where to where exactly. Obviously, record keeping back then probably wasn't the best, but she did find out that he was born in Maryland. Interesting. Yeah. So, so that's just to clarify for us. Um, so you source the distillate and then blend and barrel it, but you're going to actually be making your own distillate. When when do you expect to be able to start distilling on site? So actually, through one of the places we source from, Cartoonacy Distilling Group, we have set up a, a, a DSP where we have been distilling some. Okay. So, um, but once we get everything in there, and like I said, we're hoping, we're hoping early summer we start are still at the distillery starts rolling and and then we get going um you know our distillery farm uh, bought was a old tennessee walking horse farm so literally the distillery has a horse farm on it so she wanted to make it you know when you go to a distillery it's a very adult thing she wanted to make it a family thing so like we're setting up um restaurants inside she's doing a, a music venue to have live music out there um, she plans on having the largest bar in the world. She's been in contact with the Guinness Book of World Records. So when this, when Fawn does something, she does it big. She does. Look, if you around. want a lawyers a on the rocks family trip, and you <laughs> said you're going to show us around, you know, we can probably we can probably organize that. Let me ask you a question. Yep. I remember reading, and I don't I don't want to fuck up the story. Was it was it Dan Call that originally started brewing it behind the church with Green and got in trouble? Yes. Because <laughs> that I thought was pretty funny. So they're yeah. brewing it behind the church, and the church members don't say, We don't want you brewing whiskey there, yeah. or we, we don't did. want you just doing whiskey. It just can't be you because you're the you're the preacher. Yeah, the church. exactly. He's the preacher. And then that's where that's where Green just sort of takes over on his own. Yeah. And and does it, which yeah. I thought was just funny as shit. Yeah. I'd love to be a rabbi that distills whiskey behind a synagogue <laughs> and also sells brisket. It's kind of my dream. <laughs> I'm leaving the firm. <laughs> so that's Nathan Green was also Jewish. I would love um, so as far as your aging process, what are you expecting when you start distilling on site how long before you have your first delivered product? And, and are you planning to do any like longer aging or anything like that? Oh yeah, there's already been some of the stuff where we've laid down um, that we've distilled at DSP. Um, but um, that all depends on when the, so when the distillery is done and we have our own, we're actually going to, it's going to change the name to Nearest Green instead of Uncle Nearest. So that way you can, because a lot of distilleries source, they start it and they keep the same name, but that's kind of hard because it's really hard to match the same taste profile. Mm -hmm. So as when Sherry and Victoria get to rolling and, and find out what they think tastes the best and, and whether it's two, three, four, five years, you know, that, that's an R&D process they do. So as far as I know, I haven't heard any of those inside terms they talk about, but uh, it's, everything is on the table with them, you know. Um, we're trying to do, Fawn's trying to do something different for the whole whiskey world. So um, just because it's done in the past doesn't mean we'll do it, but she's uh, she's working on a lot of different things. That's exciting. Awesome. Yeah. Hello, so what thank you, all, you for joining us. What do you all think of the whiskey? I, I've already Mine's been kissing your gone. ass. Yeah, I, I've kissed yeah. your ass for fifteen to twenty minutes plus a prior <laughs> phone call. You know plus I like. Yeah. It, it look, and I and I guess we'll do it now. Is that at its price point, I I just struggle to think of a better whiskey at the same price point. So the eighteen eighty four is forty nine ninety nine a bottle. The eighteen fifty six in Maryland is fifty nine ninety nine a bottle. I just struggle, and I I keep comparing other ones, the Basil Hayden Woodford, mm -hmm. because those are the ones that frequently fall in that same price range. But frankly, it's better than that. And then I mm -hmm. threw out Breckenridge to you. You go to the next level of, of Jefferson or some of the some of the other Dickel. It's not. I mean, this is really nice, and and it's a very fair price point compared to some of the other ones that you're drinking it with. And you don't get a fucking hangover, and that should be on the bottle. Like you should put a sticker that says, "By the way, this is distilled in fucking coconut shells," mm -hmm. and you're not going to get a hangover. Before we let you go, though, because I, we failed you miserably, if if we can do a quick pour of the eighty four. Yep. And then, and then that way you can give us, like you said, these cinnamon tasting notes. Yeah, well, the, the 84 tends, that to me, even though it's 93 proof instead of 100, that has a little bit more burn on the finish. But with that, I get a little bit more citrus. I get some honey, um, orange peel. Um, 
Jeremy's drinking by himself. Let me, uh, let me, Gideon, can you, can you get in on this? Cause you got the 1884 and and you've got a a, a really nice palette. Yeah. I mean, um, Kurt said this when he was pouring it for me, but the nose on the 84 is awesome. It's beautiful. It's got all this deep vanilla that just like floods right up into your nose. Um, if, if I was to give it any sort of negative tick, and I think I'm being a, l- a little bit nitpicky because blends are usually not my favorite. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted like a little bit more complexity on the finish. Um, but other than that, like it, you say that it's a little spicier, but I like the spice in it. Yeah. It, it still goes down really smooth. Yeah. With the spice, which I find with some whiskeys, like if they're heavy on the spice, then oh, it like, it just gets rid of everything else. But this, mm-hmm. the, the flavors come through nicely and, uh, yeah. Yeah, last to your point, and, and you know, Victoria likes, as I say, that little oomph at the end with the 84. Uh, but yeah, some people like that, you know. I, other than drinking my stuff, which I love, I prefer an overproof thing, and I'm right there with you with a nice 120 proof whiskey. <laughs> yeah, that it's got a really nice bouquet to it. Yeah, I mean, that's I, and it's I very, had that very I had the, the 56 it's got a really nice bouquet to it yeah i i, I say 84 is kind of like our warm weather bourbon and or warm weather whiskey and and 56 is the put it in old fashioned or manhattan when it's i mean it's that stone. like when you yeah. said warm weather i could see this in a mint julep i am losing my microphone right now. yes my we, pants are falling down and i don't want anyone to see which i had a dream that i went to court without any clothes on the other day and asked for a post uh, moment <laughs> that's the shit that's happening during covid man yeah. i know you don't know our world but like that's the lawyers that wake up with night sweats when I'm in court with boxers and a t-shirt on going judge. I'm just not dressed for trial today. I need a postponement. And then my client doesn't understand why I'm naked. That's yeah. just what happens, man. So, well, look, thank you for joining us. We'd love Thanks to have you. Thanks, man. When you guys have some of these other bottles or that I'll just, I'll give you my address for that limited edition bottle. Like we agreed. <laughs> Send <them right laughs> over. Seriously, thank you for coming in on short notice. Thanks for coming on. We, yeah. And appreciate I'd love to it. meet you down in Baltimore when you're in town at the QG. All right, Thanks. Perfect. I'll definitely look you guys up. You guys have a great one now. Have a great weekend. Thanks a lot. All right. See you, Obs. All right. Take care. Bye bye. And on the next episode of Lawyers on the Rocks, is that it? I mean, that's a that's a fucking cool ass backstory, man. I mean, it's hard to compete with. Y'all have been talking about this for for a while, and um, I I didn't know the whole story. I mean, I knew a little bit of the story, but that's 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 fucking cool. Hey, the best part of it is the 1856. That's when my house was built. No shit. Same year. That's So that's what caught my eye of the bottle originally. And then I was like, oh, Uncle Nearest, that's the stuff Gideon had sent us the article about, you know, from a couple months ago. And that's the one Jeremy had taught. So it like all kind of came together yeah. when I was at the liquor store just perusing the selections. Look, I feel it's always fun to have a good story. I feel like there are a lot of very expensive whiskeys coming out that a lot of them are good, but we all sort of know as a bad joke that they're all being sourced from the same couple places. There's not much history behind them. And they're, they're good to drink. Indiana. Yeah, but there's no history. And, we're like, and Barrel, which we'll do on a, for another episode, sources from three places and puts the name of the bottle on the back. And it's 100 bucks a bottle. But once again, everyone knows that it's the guy from Boss Hog, or, uh, you know, the guy from, um, from Boss Hog that left and went over there before he passed. So it's good whiskey, but not much history. And this, I think I like it even more because it's just got such a fucking cool story attached to it. And frankly, there just not, are not a lot of uh, black owned distilleries. And so it's nice to have to feature that diversity and to feature that growth in that market that there are these other people getting into it. So go to the website. I posted on Lawyers on the Rocks beforehand. Take a look. They have a little mini book with the history. They have a bunch of photographs. Um, they had done some research into... Um, God, I'm sitting between two guys that are on their cell phones the whole time and we're on the podcast. You're turning into Kurt now. No, this right guy here. over here. I'm here. So please take a look at the history and read about it because this is definitely one of the cooler stories that we've had on the podcast. So now onto the depressing news. A teenager. Adam sent this article to me a few weeks ago and we thought it would be a good kind of segue to talk about um, negligence and personal liability for property injuries as well as sort of unusual circumstances that happen and how you're going to analyze no, this was just last week this is a real feel-good story texas weather family of 11 year old files lawsuit over death so the family of an 11 year old boy who died be, uh, in recent cold weather in texas have filed a 100 million dollar lawsuit against power companies for negligence 
Young Mr. Christian Pineda was left was found unresponsive by his mother in their mobile home last week amid freezing temperatures. Millions were left without power in the unusually cold weather, which has killed dozens in southern states. The family suspects hypothermia, but police say an official autopsy result will take weeks. The lawsuit accuses of utility firms of putting profits over welfare of people by failing to prepare properly. Both the Energy Corp, the Entergy Corporation provider and the Electric Reliability Council of Texas are named in the lawsuit. Despite having knowledge of the dire weather forecast for at least a week in advance and the knowledge that the system was not prepared for more than a decade, ERCOT and Entergy failed to make any preemptory action that could have averted the crisis and were wholly unprepared to deal with the crisis at hand. Yep. Okay. We've done this story in iterations or chapters since this natural disaster in Texas unfolded right? We've done the privatizing of the electric company versus the rest of the United States with the East and West grid. And now we're getting to the spillover onto people died, who's at fault, and who's going to pay. And, and just really quickly, just for a little bit of context here, because I think this is going to, this is important for what you're going to say, Kurt, when we get to, is there liability? Um, is that there was advance notice that this power system had issues. So 10 years ago, I don't think the article goes into this very much, but no. it references, you know, uh, they, they were aware the system was not prepared for more than a decade. There was a similar storm event, freakish in nature, that occurred um, about 10 years ago in Texas. And there was a report that came out after that that basically said, here are the issues. And then they did nothing about it. They did not absolutely nothing. Right. The other interesting thing is that power remained on in Houston office buildings, hmm. but some of the other grids and areas were left without power. And, you know, obviously they'll go through the discovery process. They'll engage in why, but like, Hey, we are also in the middle of a pandemic. Why the fuck are buildings power being prioritized over? Yeah, I don't want to say know, Enron, but like, why are the oil and gas companies' offices open and powered up while the residential when, when the buildings are most right. likely relatively empty to begin with? And the backstory there, or the context there, is that there this was a result of limited power supply because of a lack of reserves, right. and so these were planned rolling blackouts. And I think what they're getting at here, the article is short on, on sort of the details, but there seems to be an allegation that these blackouts were targeted at some low of the, income communities, right, yeah, right. the black and brown communities, right. which, which is why, and what they're talking about here, which is a mobile home, uh, a child that had no prior health issues, according to the family, and then rolling blackouts of areas for people that are frankly disenfranchised right so when you're analyzing the situation from a personal injury perspective i mean obviously the law firm believed it was appropriate to immediately file suit um typically if this was not a high profile situation you you would probably want to sit back and sort of analyze the facts and to collect, make sure you and have collect plaintiffs frankly collect other plaintiffs see if there's anybody else that was also similarly situated um that that you could bring into the fold but I think I'd like to see the autopsy report for this young man. Um, you know, it would be sort of foolhardy for the plaintiff's firm to have sued for a hundred million dollars. And it turns out that young Mr. Panetta, I'm not saying that he did, but if he had, you know, AFib or some sort of heart valve issue or some sort of, you know, like stroke or something else that caused his tragic death, um, obviously that would may or may not be attributable to the cold. Now, and the other thing that I Egg think- plaintiff? Maybe, maybe. I mean, that's where you need to gather the information, present that autopsy to a forensic pathologist, you know, have them analyze it. Um, there's a number of forensic pathologists that are retired, both from the state of Maryland and other states surrounding, you know, that have testified. They testified in the Freddie Gray case, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that sort of expertise is available. I think the other thing you're going to want to look at is, was this in fact targeted based on race? Was this in fact targeted based on income? And that's something you're only going to find out through discovery. Well, let me bring this back to Maryland and ask you a question, Kurt, which is I think the closest example that I can remember 
And it's not completely analogous because it's not weather related, but we've had multiple gas explosions in the city. And we had one in Montgomery County, one in Baltimore, and then a second one in Baltimore. So three within the last two years. And, you know, several people died. They were all in very low income areas. The one I believe was in Silver Spring. Um, and then the other two were in uh, Northwest Baltimore. And I think the reason I'm bringing it up to compare it to that is you have a large energy supplier, you have a low income neighborhood, you have questions about the maintaining of lines mm -hmm. and about and about energy going into that community and, and its impact there. And but every time something like this happens, we are frequently having the discussion of those who are harmed being in impoverished areas. And that I know it's an interesting correlation there. There was a hurricane in one of our favorite cities. This happened. Mm. I just wanted to bring it back to Maryland to say, in, in both of those cases, you know, the law firms are collecting plaintiffs, and and you, but you have people saying the same stuff. Well, was there an issue with the gas lines? Was there an issue? Um, was it BG and E, or was it that you know somebody was fooling with a gas line? But I, and, I think there's another. I mean, even. Even before you get to, I almost feel like the targeting of, of racial minorities is almost like the cherry on top here, like, or, or the icing on the cake. There's a, there's a whole cake here with respect to the fact that they were on notice for, for over 10 years yeah. that the system had issues. And so, I mean, just looking at it from a strictly sort of, well, looking at it in several different ways. I mean, the first thing is, Kurt, I guess the question I would ask you as a as the civil attorney you know how does that factor into determining liability yeah, i mean what? certainly for any kind of of uh, premises liability type case and this would be analyzed from a premises liability scenario it's was the person who had the duty on notice of the potential harm that could happen and i i think uh you know you would have to make the attenuation but the 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 link would be if it gets to be 10 degrees Fahrenheit, people die, right? And so the question becomes like, are they going to be able to, is the plaintiff's firm going to be able to make that link? You know, obviously the defense attorneys for the power company and the, the energy utility grid provider, or whoever else is named in the lawsuit is going to say, well, this was not a foreseeable consequence. 10 years later. Right. The, Except that they were the put on injury. note. Yeah. Um, the family, you know, should have sought shelter in a, in a warming center, right. should have done this, should have done this, should have done that. But and we don't know the proximate the cause of the injury. Well, proximate cause. And also there's the issue of, con you know, is there any contributor, but we don't know I, if yeah, Texas I, is I don't a know if, I don't think Texas is uh, a contrib state. There's only four. And I literally wrote an article about this. Um, Adam pushed her mic away a bit. <laughs> so the other, thank you, Giddy. I mean, the other the other sort of broader issue that I think this this case, this lawsuit and just the whole situation in Texas brings to light is in the absence of government oversight. And we talked about this last week. Um, you know, the whole reason this happened is because. Texas government didn't want to be regulated by the federal government, they wanted their power grid to be, you know, I'm simplifying it, but. In a, in a, they deregulated. In a, that they deregulated. They cut themselves off from the rest of 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 you know the the larger national grid, so that they could do this. So, for for folks like this, for citizens of the state of Texas like this, what recourse do they have other than through the courts? None, because there's no democratic. None. This is the problem with states like Texas and the direction I think in a in a broader sense that the United States is going where you know, it's very difficult for the will of the people to come through in this deregulatory push, this, you know, sort of minority rule type system well, that we've entered into. Yeah. And I, maybe I'm stretching it too far, but yeah. let's just leave it in Texas where the majority of the citizens of Texas has said, we don't want our government interfering in this and the government didn't interfere in it. So what's the recourse other than oh, this? Oh, look, this I mean, I it, think right? it can be highlighted by the simple fact that like you had a number of, of there was a mayor in Texas who said, folks, you're on your own. Right. Yeah, Colorado Springs. And, and you know, that's the predominant attitude, the prevailing attitude in the state of Texas. If you want to live in Texas, if you want to be Elon Musk and you want to relocate to Texas, that's what you're going to get. Well, that is that a real man would have kept his family warm. And, I, right. you know, so I'm like, 
very much a capitalist, but I also think that we do not live in a capitalist country at all by any way, shape or form. We live in crony capitalism, um, which, you know, involves corporations and, and wealthy individuals being able to manipulate the market to their own advantage. And, and when you're talking about market manipulation, you know, I mean, it's pretty clear that the Texas, you know, power grid situation would have been rectified were they, you know, bound by federal regulatory standards. It's, it's very simple. I mean, you know, when, when, and we talked about this last week, BGE really got put through the ringer in after Maryland. the derecho in 2012 in Maryland, yeah. you know, and they really got put through the ringer. I mean, and rightfully so they make huge windfall profits you know, they, they have a responsibility because, you know, a hundred years ago, all of these electric grids were owned by municipalities, right? right. They right. weren't, I mean, they were public utilities, right? Not private utilities. And I'm not saying yeah, like on monopoly. Okay. I was going to, I was going to go there. Yeah. I was, I, dude, I bought all the railroads, the utilities. If you got the four, if you get the, four, I know this because we play Monopoly frequently in my house. So you build Crush hotels on them. I love building hotels on them. And then like the kids get you cancer and then they sue you. Can't you can't build No, you build hotels on them and then the kids get cancer. What kind of modified play? fucking rules? It's the yelling? lawyer plaintiff's version of Monopoly. That sounds like you your Monopoly game is highly the- deregulated. Is not the way you play fucking Monopoly. Right. I play, I play capitalist time. Monopoly. <laughs> Monopolist Monopoly. No, All right. look, I think I'm, the takeaway here, and I do want to get to the next topic, but I do think, and we'll see. I mean, I think this is going to be something that a, a topic, it's already two weeks in a row. This was a significant event yeah. in Texas. I think we're going to see the repercussions of this politically, um, in terms of, you know, on these types of legal issues, I think these are going to be far reaching. I and really if you do. didn't get enough Adam Crandall from this episode. Please go back and listen to the last episode, which was the Ted Cruzarita episode we did with life size margaritas in Dia de los Muertes candle glasses. And Adam just fills up that episode nicely. All right. Um, I wanted to throw this out there. Adam, Adam followed up on an update of a story from last week. The boss has been vindicated. Oh, hold on, we gotta, we gotta drink one for him, right? We gotta pour one out but, for but the boss. Was, but he wasn't drinking. He was drinking, no, he, no, he, he was. admitted to I'm drinking. Kidding, he did not admit he to did. drinking and driving while impaired. And so the boss uh, pled guilty on Wednesday to charges that he imbibed in alcohol at New Jersey's Shandy Hook, Sandy, Sandy Hook National Recreation Area, despite knowing it was prohibited. I had two small shots of tequila, the boss said in a virtual appearance, in New Jersey federal court. The plea came after federal prosecutors agreed to drop the DUI charges and reckless driving, according to Assistant U.S. Attorney Adam Baker. That's not Adam Baker that used to be a law clerk for this, is it? I don't know. We're going to have to find out. I bet you that motherfucker's got a signed uh, Born to Run LP hanging in his office right (laughs) now. Yeah, (laughs) Motherfucker. I want that shit. Dude, I just want some of his quotes with cigarettes. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Quotes, so, baby. so nothing uh, is BAC reading was 0.02. Is well, the court is well, one under, well aware it's under the legal limit of 0.08. Well, Springsteen has often sung about driving suicide machines down the New Jersey Turnpike and bragged of having his carburetor baby cleaned and checked with her lines blown out. She's running like a turbo jet and, and saying sell out. And sang of being sprung from cages on Highway 9, chrome field, chrome wheeled, fuel injected, and stepping out over the line. Judge Mottone Ma- remarked on the singer's incredibly clean driving record. <laughs> so this is the judge quoting this at allocution. I have in front of me the driver's abstract of this defendant going all the way back to 1973. There's three violations. In fact, two of them aren't violations. And the third one is use of a cell phone device. Rarely would Outside you ever see, <laughs> rarely would you ever see an abstract devoid of entries as I have before me, Mr. Springsteen. He's been on a tour bus for 50 years. I was years. like, I was yeah. like, that motherfucker has a driver. That's yeah, why he doesn't have any speeding tickets. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, raise yeah. it's, it's a good follow-up though. This this entire article and that out that that allocution at sentencing definitely calls into question the entire premise behind racing in the streets one of my favorite springsteen songs on the darkness on the edge of town record um i'm not sure that any longer that that's based on truth you know what it felt i really felt like it just vindicated our podcast because 
Kurt and I went so fucking hard at like, this is bullshit. <laughs> and he should have been charged. And like, you don't ever want it to come back. That's like, actually he pled guilty to DWI. Right. Like this completely shows that Kurt and I we're right. We do know we were what right. we're doing. Yeah. Occasionally. I mean, we're, we're pretty much always right. We just can't say that on the podcast. But I just want to put it out there, bro. We're like super right. Super you guys, right. you I'm guys, honest. you're left though. I'm right. Tonight, I'm the left nut. You guys are lower. You guys are excellent armchair DUI lawyers. <laughs> Fuck you. What was Says the guy wearing ankle socks in the middle of winter. I mean, you look it's, like a Mexican beach bum. It's almost spring. Jeez. <laughs> oh, All right. Next topic. In this week's uh, segment of I Can't Believe It's Not Baltimore, balloon boys' parents are pardoned by Colorado governor. Excuse me. I would just like That's to say Uncle thank Nearest. you. Thank you, Governor. The so-called <laughs> balloon boy incident captivated television audiences in 2009 as the parents of a six-year-old appropriately named Falcon reported he had been carried away in a large UFO-like balloon thousands of feet in the air. I did not carry it away. I flew. News media tracked <laughs> the balloon. The National Guard sent two helicopters in a rescue attempt, and the Denver International Airport was temporarily closed as thousands of people awaited news of the boy's fate. They should have sent airwolf. Falcon's parents, Richard and Mayumi Keen, told authorities he was accidentally carried thousands of feet in the air into the sky in a homemade weather balloon experiment gone wrong. I got so high. But after the balloon landed, authorities did not find Falcon inside. Instead, he had been hiding the box in the family attic the entire time. I got you. It was all a joke. It turned out to be a lot of hot air. And here's where the puns begin, folks. The parents pled guilty to a few crimes surrounding the incident after authorities said it was a hoax planned by the family. On Wednesday, Governor Jared Polis pardoned the parents in the so-called balloon boy incident in the case of richard mayumi the balloon boy's parents we are all ready to move past the spectacle from a decade ago that wasted precious time and resources of law enforcement officials and the general public because now i'm a balloon man wait we I all oh nine he's like 20 we all moved past this shit they didn't have to pardon them no one gives a fuck anymore well, here and here's why Richard and Mayumi have paid a price in the eyes of the public, served their sentences, and it's time for us to move on. It's no longer, it's time to no longer let a permanent criminal record from the Balloon Boy saga drag the parents down. They were the featured twice uh, on Celebrity Wife Swap. Oh, so, okay. so the, really? that's what's yeah, hilarious yeah, about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, Half yeah. the article is they were so, so where oh, it comes so from bad. To us, right? Is Adam, so the, the parents were not United States citizens. So part mom. of this, what mom was not. So mom says, oh, I pled guilty because there was a threat of, of a much worse sanction and I wasn't a United States citizen. And I only did it because of that, right? So she pled guilty and this has ruined my life. But while it ruined her life, she was also doing wife swap twice. So it was so bad for them that they went on wife swap. Well, their lawyer, David, because their lawyer, any, David Lane any, because said, any woman who lies about her balloon boy being in a fucking balloon is doesn't end up on wife swap. That was like the most logical connection for reality. Jeremy, their lawyer released a statement saying, what did, what did you say? We're grateful. <laughs> we're grateful. The balloonacy has ended. Oh, uh, yeah, that was good. Their three sons, Ryo, Bradford and Falcon, even defended the claims in an original heavy metal song titled Balloon Boy. No hoax. Is this a mad? Are we doing Mad Libs? What the fuck are you talking about? A heavy metal song? <laughs> really? Falcon, Ryo, and Bradford were in a heavy I, metal sure band. You, weren't you in the band with him back in? Yeah, seriously. I those are pretty back, back in the college days. No offense. You look like a Falcon. You could have in that outfit and those glasses. You could have been Falcon Crandall. Falcon Heen. I mean, I could have been in practice with a lawyer named Falcon. Well, I mean, you're. Never mind. Can we can we end with a quote from the pardon the recently felon who's recently pardoned felon, Mr. Heen, who said, I'm flying high. This is just fantastic. No, he did not say that. He did, I swear to God, it's, it's the, the title of his Yeah, it's the it's the uh <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. So I hate everything about this segment. The question is it just makes me angry. The question is what? Has it happened in Baltimore? Has it Are happened you, in Baltimore? No, because that six-year-old would have been in the balloon.
has a media has a media hoax Good happened job. in Baltimore? Was it a cocaine I mean, balloon? Right. Yeah. Ooh, can you good question? Yeah. yeah that's was it a heroin good, balloon. Yeah. Right. Did you swallow a heroin balloon yeah, while you were flying to the boy. airport? D- it depends on the definition of balloon. Right, it depends Gideon? on the definition of flying. Right. Were you just <laughs> driving fast, running from the cops? Well, he would have been high. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. I mean, a media hoax like this in Baltimore. I don't know, guys. Come on. There's got to be some shit. We got we some hard hitting reporters. There was a woman who ran for Congress last time, right after Elijah died. And she she currently has a case pending, but I, if I remember correctly, there was a faux kidnapping involving her that she claimed her child had been kidnapped. Which one, the, the stripper from the stripper from Baltimore County? No, all the strippers are down at City Hall right now protesting. Don't snub the club. So they're That's all, right. and then preventing Marilyn Mosby from boycotting her own mm-hmm. vindication by someone that can't vindicate her. You got to stay current with the times, bro. Open all, the club, shorty. All, yeah, all the all the don't listener the listener George wants to know why the why the family just had a hot air balloon hanging out in their yard. This is a good, good question. That's a good really, question. I'm Listen sorry, George. I missed that. Is that George Smith? Mm-hmm. See, here's the thing, George Smith. You were like five years old when this thing happened. <laughs> the rest of us actually lived through it and remember a time when stories like this made the national news. Yeah, when and six-year-olds went up fake hot air balloons. <laughs> Was it you, George Smith? Were you balloon boy? George did it. I don't know why they had a but why did they have a balloon? Because they live Letters, in Denver. Because they live in Denver. Yeah, they live in, Col- yeah, they live in Colorado. That's how you get around. They, they fucking, yeah, fucking. You buy those on Craigslist? Colorado. Hot air balloons? If you, li- if you move to Colorado in the in the aughts, you got a balloon. <laughs> they gave you a yeah, balloon. Yeah, yeah, no. Now they give you a bag of weed. Yeah. Before, it was before it was a weed. Before weed, they just why gave you a balloon. Listen, guys. I, I, I don't take Next topic. Seriously. All right. This so, is where we end. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know, and we are running short on time. This is quite the Guinness Book of World Records story right here. 0.77 BAC, highest ever reported. Police identified a DUI suspect as Nathan Danzuka, 28 years old. He was arrested last year for DUI reckless endangerment, according to jail records. This, please tell me this is Florida. Blood? Florida. No. Come on, Florida. Nope, 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 on, nope, nope. Ohio? No, no, you won't guess it. Come on, Don't Ohio. You won't, go ahead. Arkansas. Won't it. What, we got some other guesses? Adam, listeners, any guesses before we go forward? Florida and Ohio have already been taken off the table. We currently have Arkansas. Nope. Nope. Anybody? And I almost read the article too. Upon this, this is a hard guess. Really? Maryland. No. No. No, you're not going to. No, guess definitely it. not. Because I actually, when I got this story, I did per chance email two supervising supervising attorneys to say had they ever seen a bac this high because it, this is like double the amount that i've ever seen is the this highest like i've ever this seen is, is 0.44 this that's is dead exactly, that's what i saw i've True. seen 0.44 twice i was gonna ask like this is really really close to you can't Death. survive yeah yes right. like, correct a- you mean we shove a tap in his belly button and drink him on the next podcast yeah this is like 10 <laughs> times this is about 10 times the legal limit um it did happen in oregon Oh, we had North Carolina, Alaska, and North Dakota. All wrong uh, all guesses, guesses by listeners. Good guesses. Alaska, especially, I think is a good guess, as is North Dakota. Yeah. North Carolina, I, I think North, North Carolina, Carolina was just a dig at the, deal, no, the heels. I would have got North Carolina felt like a great guess to me. I mean, to get to 0.77 in North Carolina, you would have to drink like 478 natural lights. No, see, I, I was thinking <laughs> moonshine. I would have gone straight to the shine, like Virginia. Yeah, you don't get this high. You only, oh, you right. can that's only a good, get that's this good. high yeah, like with Like 93, with unleaded. Liquor. Yeah. Like, you got, like you some, know, yeah. All right, so gin. so just, just to reference sort of where 0.77 is on the BAC on chart. The Richter scale. 0.08 <laughs> is the legal limit, okay? And I got this chart from uh, duiawareness.com or something like that. Um, 0.00 to 0.05 indicates mild speech impairment, attention, coordination, balance. Which is this podcast. Um, increased in, in impairment between 0.06 and 0.15. Obviously, 0.08 is the legal limit. Uh, perceived uh, relaxation, increasing intoxication, aggression, speech memory, 
uh, attention, coordination, balance, further impaired, significant impairment of all driving skills, increased risk of injury to self or others, moderate memory impairments. Okay, so oh, that was the when second start, episode of the podcast. Where, do, where does the perceived ability to fly in a hot air balloon come in? That's that we're getting there. Severe okay. impairment, speech, memory, condition, attention, reaction time, balance, significantly impaired above 0.16. All driving related We're still skills point ones. Impaired. This homie was into point sevens, man. Oh, you see, got to speed this okay. up. At a point three, yeah, you risk dying. All right, keep going. No, that's it. It doesn't. The scale doesn't even go above a point three, and this guy was more than double that. But but on top of it, this dude got behind the wheel of a car. He hit a fucking concrete barrier. He drove the car, and not surprisingly, crashed his car following a quote. Short police chase. I'm surprised there was any chase. <laughs> <laughs> that so, is phenomenal. So it only That's happens, like, I mean, in all like, honesty, in, in, in setting all joking aside, you only see super high BACs in individuals who are either completely sloshed or occasionally heavy drinking problems. Heavy drinking yeah, problems. Yeah, so yeah. you'll Go see so you'll see folks with 0. 0.2, 0. 0.3, and they'll they'll pass field sobriety tests. I've had clients who have passed field sobriety tests. My point four, four, and I don't think it was the same case that you had, was a, a Russian guy that had just flown in from Russia to BWI, rented a car. So he had drank heavily on the plane. He then managed, and I don't know how, to have a, a very large vodka bottle in the vehicle with him and like a handle that he had finished. And then the cops pulled him over on 895. So we're talking about 15 to 20 minutes Man. in the airport now. I will say the other thing about these incredibly high breaths that, that I think Kurt will probably confirm is a lot of the time it's mouth alcohol because the person will have been drinking in the vehicle. Well, this so, was a blood kit case, oh, that's according it. to the article. And I got nothing to say. So mouth so, alcohol, just for our listeners, is if you're drinking and you blow, the idea of, the, of taking the breath test is that you're getting lung air. You're not getting air that's straight from your mouth because you have alcohol in your mouth right well an example of that would be that if i took a swig of this alcohol right now which you will do it. and then i immediately took a breath test my breath test would be invalid because it's going to be the mouth alcohol that's associated with my breath that's causing the this high registration on the kit? test this is a blood kit i'm also is that like four year aged can we order the blood kit like, can we sample the blood I kit i Dude, this is a rounding error too, because the, the paper says, or the article says 0.77, but then it says that the BAC level, according to the blood kit was 0.778. So I think if you round, you do I'll round, tell you, you, why. you don't round up, you don't round, you round exactly. down. So in DUIs uh, and on breath tests, they'll get, you'll take two samples. And it, if it falls within 0.1, then you'll take a third sample, but they always round down. So they're, you get really lucky sometimes because, for instance, a huge dividing line on Maryland DUIs is 0. 0. 0.15, 0. 0.15 because that's the difference between maybe getting a restricted license, which is not having the interlock ignition device mm -hmm. installed in your vehicle versus 0. 0.15 where you may have to. So, And you'll see people that have blew a 0. 0.15, you know, 0. 0.150 and then a 0. 0.149 and they'll get the benefit of the 0. 0.149. So should I, a restricted license. should I, you know, we have distance learning going on. Kids are in school at home. I've been listening. You're going with this. I've been listening to a lot of the math classes with my kids, and they're learning rounding. And if it's point five, if it's five and up, you round up. If it's five, I would like to go on as a public service announcement to Ms. Fry's Federal Hill Prep second grade class. It only applies to drinking. This is you just Chatty. Have caveat this is Chatty Crandall's father. It's point. <laughs> if it's five and up, you round up, unless it's a DUI. Yeah, if there's alcohol involved, you which round is what down. I love about this. Unless you've you been drinking, down. then you round down. You always round down. Uh, this is there needs to be a though. fucking this asterisk is a good, on that. This is a good story. This guy fascinating. had to have drank an entire bottle and then some of whiskey and then been functional enough to drive. That's the only way this could have happened. And the like, article is a little... He didn't die. The, the postscript here says that previously the highest blood alcohol contents reported in these pages... Which I'm assuming is the it's smoking gun Oregonian. No, smoking gun. Oh, smoking gun. Yeah, so, so that's national, they do they national across, website. Yeah. They they collect data. Point seven two. Point seven two, and point seven zero eight, which we would round down to a point seven zero 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 point seven zero zero point seven zero. 
Um, and Oregon, congratulations. You have number one and number two. Congrats. Yeah, so I didn't Good job, survey, Oregon. I didn't survey, um, there were a couple of defense attorneys that I suppose I could have reached out to, but I did survey two supervisors who handled traffic cases and they both said in the fours was the highest they'd ever look, seen as young and these are folks that have been doing it for for you know both of them have been doing it for more than a look, decade as young prosecutors to to end this on a funny note you know you you get shoved into to incarcerable traffic courts so you're dealing with duis driving while suspended but duis are the most important thing you're dealing with in those courtrooms so the two things that all the baby prosecutors will run around and show each other are driving records with really high point totals Right. So like, oh, man, this guy's got 700 points. points, right? <laughs> because it's like all these driving while revokes and DUIs or you get the really high DUI tests. Mm -hmm. And so but if you're saying I mean, I don't remember ever seeing that. No, that high. I never saw I never anything saw above a point five. Yeah, yeah, I saw Not stuff in the close. fours and I saw people throwing. I think up, we've had we, shitting themselves. We've only people had pissing clients, themselves multiple times. We've and only I've had never seen above that. in the threes in private practice. I've only seen clients in the fours in well i was a prosecutor when kurt you got yours was a two seven right right or a three right eight. um so we so i i don't <laughs> we have two sort of back-to-back -back stories i really 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 wanted to do them but we're running up on an hour oh that was it i did oh shit you put them on the back <laughs> you put them on the back page didn't you I put them on the back page. i already flipped my notes i already tossed are we my still notes. gonna zoom are we still um, already zooming? tossed them we're still zooming Can so end but with the zoom? hold on hold on i've i've, I've got a couple I listener comments I'm sorry I've got a couple of listener comments. So um, first of all, listener Peter says, Jeremy, that was clearly your BAC the entire time while you were in college, except you're a lightweight bitch. So it only took a couple of drinks. Did you add the bitch or was the bitch there? No, I added the bitch. So you didn't take any creative <laughs> license with I didn't, that? I might have. The second, the second one was from listener Katie. How did he not die? I die every weekend after <laughs> every, every 487 <laughs> natty lights. I See? die every weekend. See? <laughs> Oh, I die every weekend. I saw it. I should have bought you the largest case of Natty Light strawberry lemonade fizz. Mm. I don't even know what that is, but it it's was like terrible. It was 74 cans or something in a box. It wasn't a 30 pack. Did you buy it? No, because I'm not buying strawberry lemonade fucking fizz. It's terrible. No, I've had the strawberry lemonade natural light. It's horrible. It's really bad. Really? No, yeah. Why does it come it's in such bad. a big yeah. box? Well, because Natty Light, it like, I mean, their suitcase. You know they sell the 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 suitcase, which is like just like thirty eight. So you just double that, and it's like, Katie, do you drink to deal with him? Like I don't I don't know why like you the do. regular I, case of natural light is like a carry on, but then the, they had to get rid of the strawberry lemonade, so they made it like you got to check that shit. Wow. So, it's, uh, it's so I I I happened to raz Katie after she said that. Um, she drinks all that natty light, and I said you you need to drink better alcohol, and she said she will. Once you give her some uncle nearest. Ooh, be a better brother, Adam. Be a better brother. I tell you what, Katie, I'm coming down to North Carolina next month, and I have heard that there is a, a special limited edition Carolina's version of the natural light can what? that's currently being Stop. sold only in the Carolinas. So I will bring you a bottle of either the 1884 or the 1880, uh, 1856 in exchange for uh, a couple of suitcases of the Carolinas natural light can. I'm just ashamed to be friends and partners with you sometimes. Why? I don't, I just thought you were like a high class bitch and then I found out you were low class <laughs> whore. With this natty light, which are like rip stockings. Time I don't even man. know what to do with I got you. a sweater hoodie on. Exactly, you got a sweaty. <laughs> You switch from the scarf to the swooty. Okay. Um, I, Next I wanted to, so I'm going to throw out a couple of things about the drink that we didn't touch on before. So the hundred proof, I probably would put rocks in it. I, you know, but that's me. That's is not that necessarily, the 56? that's 1856. Yes. I, you know, that's the one I picked up. The other one, I think you could drink straight, although I did put a cube in it. No, you're drinking the 84. The I'm 84 drinking... was the second one that I know, we had. I know. He's talking about putting rocks in the 84. What's your thoughts, Gideon? Uh, rocks in the 84? You mean rocks in the 84? No, 56. 1856. Oh. See, I thought it's the just 100 proof. Smooth, just a little, see, I, little go... I thought it was smooth fine, but it was just a little too high alcohol content for me. Just to slow it, just to pump just the brakes. To, a just bit. to pump the brakes a little bit. Yeah. I've been drinking the 84 since we started, and I'm starting to wonder if my BAC is like 0.2. So, 
I'm not sure how you guys are surviving the 56 right now. Um, Gideon, can you show them your bottle that you brought? Do you have your mason jar? Do you have your mason jar? It's this is so, ladies and gentlemen, just so you know, a little behind I the scenes. A lot of Holy just, shit, A little behind man. the scenes on Lawyers on the Rocks during COVID. Gideon brings his baby bottle down to the office, and then we fill the baby bottle. And we fill that fucker more than, I'd say, at least halfway, if not more. Yeah, that was yeah. a big mason jar. And uh, I'm proud of you, buddy. I'm proud of That's you. That's good. I'm prouder of you than I am of the Mims twins. It's good. It's it's really tasty. I like it a lot. Um, like I said, the, my only dig on it, like I said, was I wish the finish was a, a, had a little bit more on it. It kind of just kind of stops on you, where some of the uh, more refined whiskeys I've had kind of like, like linger and keep going. And so you just like kind of keep tasting it for a little while. Um, but this this goes down real easy, which is why um, you know I'm probably sitting at a at a point one. I should not drive. Luckily, I don't have to. If you can't finish the number, then you shouldn't drive. So uh, the only thing I'll, I'll add on this, because I've been kind of quiet about it. Um, I, I think this, these are, so it was interesting that we had OBS on and he was saying he was a Kentucky dude. And, you know, normally I think we tend more towards the bourbons. Bourbon, little sweet. These, these tend more towards that. I, th- I thought with the 1856, it's got that sweet, it's very sweet on the, uh, like at the, at the start. Um, and then, you know, it finishes a little, a little stronger, but I thought this was, this tended way more towards, towards what I would consider to be a typical bourbon, just with the sweetness factor, which is a huge plus for me. I like that. That's good. I mean, it's really good. Gideon's getting a shout out from listener Peter. I I like how, (laughs) I like how Gideon told the rep he didn't like it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, but we're, we're honest on this show. We are honest on the show. And what I appreciated about Ob's statement was they're in the process of making their own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, yeah, I would be I would be excited. The price you just can't the price point, and that's why I throw these other ones out. I mean, we drink a lot on the show. We drink every fucking Friday, right? And when we do that, and we have a lot of these same whiskeys in that price point on, we're brutally honest about what we drink. And yeah. that's why, yeah. I'm I'm happy with what I'm drinking. I would the bouquet on the 84. It's phenomenal. It's yeah. it's really good. Yeah. And it's it phenomenal. stopped it stopped short a little on you, right? And if it was a hundred dollars, I'd probably have more of a problem with it. Right. But at forty nine ninety nine, I have a whole hot, hell of a lot less of a problem with it because everything else in its price point really doesn't touch it. So. Well, and you know, look, like I love the story. I love the the change in the industry. I love the idea of being able to support a business, um, you know, to sort of move those things forward. And so, you know if it's equal to every other brand, all the history and all the backstory and, and the current ownership and everything they're trying to do to change the industry, that to me is going to push it over the edge every time. Look, they got a Whiskey Dads podcast that is part of Uncle Nearest. I want to invite on Whiskey Dads. We got three whisk, four Whiskey Dads right here. I don't want to be discriminated against. Uncle Nearest, I'm calling you out right now. I want to invite on Whiskey Dads. It's a great name of a podcast. I won't fuck no. That is I'll, a great I'll stop cursing. That is a great name. That's almost as good as our name. Yeah, I mean, it's almost. It's definitely second. Yeah. Always, always yeah, and look out for our bloopers episode entitled Gideon. What's our bloopers episode going to be called now? Do our, we have one? Our ulterior motive? Booze in order. Booze bing, in bing. Order. That was all Gideon right there. So look out, ladies and gentlemen. Booze in order? I'm going to have to find it. Dun, dun. You can't say it without doing the dung dung. <laughs> Well, thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Lawyers on the Rocks. We hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed making. You can check us out online at lawyersontherocks.com. <laughs> that's that's, that's, this is that's, that's my BAC <laughs> counting right there. Did you make potty? Um, we can, I've got my potty pants on. We, <laughs> check us out online. Leave us a five-star review. Do us a huge favor. We're trying to grow our audience. We're trying to, you know, do some different things here. We'll take four stars too, just not three. Five stars, At five stars, but share, share our posts, like our posts. And check uh, out our YouTube you know, channel. Check out our YouTube channel, which Gideon someday is going to blow up. And, it's and we'll have our videos Maddie on Light. there. Thanks, guys. We're just sitting here for no. Yeah, there you go. That's your cue, Gideon. He's like the fucking elevator guy. <laughs> Press the button, bitch. Sorry, I got distracted. Dude, I'm I'm this alcohol has gone so far to my head. I had so many things.